Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neil Netanel. I'm a professor at the UCLA School of Law and the interim director of the Eunice and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israel Studies here at UCLA. The Center for Israel Studies promotes the study of the history, culture, and society of Israel as a modern Jewish and democratic state. We sponsor courses about various facets of modern Israel for students of all backgrounds here on campus. We also sponsor innovative research and we bring leading scholars, policymakers, writers, filmmakers, and artists to UCLA for public performances, uh, lectures, and programs. And we are delighted this evening to host Ari Shavit and Rob Eshman for a conversation about Ari's book, My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. The book uh, has been a New York Times bestseller and has generated widespread critical acclaim and debate in the United States. We thank our co-sponsors for this event, UCLA Hillel. Ari Shavit is a leading Israeli columnist and writer. He was born in Rehovot, Israel. Shavit served as a paratrooper in the Israel Defense Forces and studied philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In the 1980s, he wrote for the progressive weekly Koteret Leshit. In the early 1990s, he was the chairperson of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. In 1995, he joined Haaretz, uh, Israel's, one of Israel's lady, leading newspapers, where he serves currently on the editorial board. Shavit is also a leading commentator on Israeli television. He's married, he has a daughter and two sons, and lives in Kfar Shmayahu. Rob Eshman is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Jewish Journal and of JewishJournal.com. All right, so uh, our conversation today will be video recorded for podcasting uh, later. It'll be uh, the podcast will be available on the Center for Israel Studies website. And this is how our event today will be structured. Ari will speak for roughly 20 minutes about his book. Rob will then join in in the conversation for about a half hour. And then we will open it up to questions from the audience. We're going to take the first three questions from UCLA students, and then we'll open it up to other members of the UCLA community, uh, to members of the public, as well as to other students who might have questions. We will have ushers holding microphones in the aisles, so if you wish to, wish to ask a question, you'll need to go to the aisle where the usher will hold the mic. Following our discussion, Ari will be signing books in the library. Sorry, in the, in, the, in the lobby, not the library. There's a lot more books in the library than you can possibly sign. Um, okay, so with that, I welcome out uh, Ari Shavit and Rob Eshman. Well, a, uh, we usually say it's a pleasure and honor. In, the, in this case, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to see how many of you are here. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I traveled a long way, uh, but uh, already in the last uh, 36 hours, I've uh, rather fell in love with your city. Um, so I'm really, really uh, honored to be here, and I hope we can have an interesting conversation. I'm uh, really much more into the conversation, less into the lecturing, uh, and I'm really eager to see what I will be asked here, and especially what, what, what's in, on your minds. Uh, but I'll begin with saying a few words about the book and why I wrote it, to put things in context from my point of view. Uh, looking forward to, to the discussion we'll have uh, in the coming hour or two. When I set out to write My Promised Land some years ago, many people 
warned me that it's a bad idea. First of all, they said no one would read it. <laughs> that people are tired of Israel and no one will write another, read another Israel book. But beyond that, their claim was, why write another Israel book, as there are so many? And there are. I gave this some thought, and I came up actually with two answers. One was that it was my own personal need. It was my existential need in the philosophical, personal way, not in the kind of Iran strategic threat way. <laughs> Ever since I remember myself, I remember being aware of the fact that I was born in a unique nation, in a unique country, into a unique historical event. And I always wanted to decipher it, to try to understand what is this country that I was born in all about. So there was a deep personal need. But then, as I looked at the shelf of Israel books, I realized that for a long time, there has not been a book written that deals with the overall Israeli condition in a kind of personal, deep way. There are many, many great Israel books, biographies, history books, political books, sociological books, polemics, more polemics, more and more polemics. And yet that book that I thought should be there was not there, definitely not written in the last decades by an Israeli. And I realized that this is no accident, that the reason that there isn't such Israel book, which is in my mind so needed, is that we in Israel lost our narrative. And this is very troubling to any nation, but it is especially troubling to a nation like Israel. Because Judaism, to begin with, came from the book. And Zionism, too, was creation of a story, of a strong sense of meaning, of knowing where we've come from and we, where we want to go. And the sad thing about Israel is that the stronger it became economically, physically, militarily, the more it lost the narrative. To begin with, we had a narrative when there was no, nothing there. There was no entity there. But the stronger the entity became, the narrative, the context, the big picture, were lost. Why were they lost? I think there were two or three reasons for that. One was the 1967 war, which launched the great debate over the territories, whether they are occupied or liberated or whatever they are. And that debate divided the Israel narrative. In the old days, even when I grew up, we were deeply within the ethos of what my elder friend, this great Israeli poet Chaim Gouri, called the ethos of the besieged and the just. That was what we were about. But since 1967, that narrative split into several ones. We lost that, lost that strong sense. And every year that went by, it got worse. The second reason we lost our narrative is that we've become cynical. Many people think that the trouble with Israel is the fact that it's extremist, that extremist, extremist forces drive it. And there is a serious problem with Israeli extremism. But in my mind, the problem of many of my fellow Israelis is the problem that we've become cynical. And if we, 1967 split the narrative, it is the war in 1973 that to changed totally our attitude to ourselves and made us somewhat cynical. In many ways, the 1973 war is Israel's World War I. So many people were killed, and the result was that the old order, the ancien regime of Israel, disappeared. It's quite 
similar to what happened to the old royalties and old order of Europe. So if before 1973 we kept telling ourselves how wonderful we are, how righteous we are, how handsome and blonde we are, <laughs> after 1973 and even more so after the political change of the late 70s, we've become more and more cynical in our attitude to ourselves. So if to begin with we were too committed, too mobilized, too within the lines of that narrative and that great belief in our ethos, in the last 30, 40 years we've become too critical, too judgmental, and too cynical. So what I tried to do is to write a book that although will deal with our history, will not be a history book. And although it will be relevant to our politics, it will not be a political book. What I wanted to write is a book that will bring the Israel story back to the human level. I wanted to transcend many of the conflicting narratives and debates, and I wanted to draw attention to the big picture, to the larger context of what Israel is. In many ways, this is a book of a villager climbing the hill and trying to look at his own village, trying to understand what his village is all about. Where does it happen? What's the context within, it, with, within which it lives? It's a book of an insider, and I'm as insider Israeli as anyone, both because of my background, my personality, and my profession. But I'm an insider who took a step back and tried to look at his own country from the outside. So what did I do? I asked myself three questions. In my mind, these are the true Israel questions. Why Israel? What's Israel? and will Israel. But I did not try to answer these questions with arguments, with a theory, with an ideology. The book has many insights, and I hope some of them are interesting. It has many ideas, and I hope some of them are creative. But it's not about insights and ideas. It's really an attempt to deal with these fundamental questions by telling the Israel story again in a fresh way, in a human way, making it a human story. Naturally, I began with my own beginning, with the arrival of my great-grandfather in the port of Jaffa in April 1897. My great-grandfather, Herbert Bentwich, was a successful British lawyer. He was not a typical Jew for that period of time. In many ways, he was 100 years ahead of his time because he resembled, in many ways, so many American, successful American Jews of the day. At that time, he belonged to a very small percentage of the Jewish population who really made it and had a good life, in this case, in Britain. So I asked myself, why would such a gentleman, who was, except for the first he was Jewish, he was a Victorian gentleman in any way. He loved Britain, he loved the Queen, he loved the theater, he loved Shakespeare, he loved the Lake District, and he's loved, he loved his vacations on the Cornwall coast. Why would he travel all that way to the remote, desolate wasteland that Palestine was? And I came up with two answers. The first one is, that the brilliant idea the founding Zionists had in the 1890s is their realization that Europe is becoming a death trap to its Jews. They realized that the new anti-Semitism in Europe that was nation-based and racist-based is becoming more dangerous than the old religious-based anti-Semitism. They did not know that the 20th century will produce such places as Auschwitz and Treblinka. But they realized that something bad is going to happen. 
Some of them imagine some sort of mega program. Some of them just realize that there is no future for the Jews there. But looking at this, looking at this radical, dramatic problem, they did not despair. They did not give up. They did not whine or cry. They decided to answer this radical challenge with a radical solution. And their solution was as radical as can be. Because what they did is to transfer a people from one continent to another, to take a land, to build a nation, to revive a language, and all that in order to build a home for a homeless people that was in jeopardy. They acted, they had amazing insight, but they also had imagination and determination, and they acted in the most sophisticated and sometimes cunning ways in order to save their own people. So when people attack Zionism today, sometimes in academic circles and institutions, sometimes even in this country, that really makes me outrageous. Because the Zionists were not colonialists. They were not the agents of some empire. They were the ultimate victims of Europe who acted with sophistication, using European power and knowledge in order to save their people from Europe. This is what the Zionism was all about. And Zionism's only real sin was that it was too late. Because if Herzl would have started his great endeavor 20 years earlier, if the Balfour Declaration would have given, been given 20 years earlier, and if we had had a Jewish state in that land in the 1920s rather than in 1948, millions and millions of Europe's Jews would have been saved. But there was an un another insight, too. My great-grandfather and his colleagues and his peers realized that once the pogroms will be over and anti-Semitism will not be as violent as it was, the Jewish people will face another challenge. Because while for 1,500 1, years the Jews survived in the diaspora, within the defense of the walls of the ghetto, and thanks to their intimate relationship with God, these two factors were changing. And the result was that modern existence, the modern era, has created a huge challenge for Jewish existence. While ultra-Orthodox Jews do not have, did not, do not have, and will not have a problem ensuring their future, because they'll always be able to have a Jewish ghetto in Brooklyn or Antwerp or anywhere else. Non-ultra-Orthodox Jews are challenged in the modern era. Their future is in doubt. Our future is in doubt. And because this is the case, there was a need to create a national home for the Jews that will be the powerhouse of non-Orthodox Jewish identity. So while in one way, the early Zionists acted in the 1890s to preempt the 1940s. In another way, they acted in order to preempt the Pure Report. They realized what are the challenges that we will be facing in this country now. And they acted over 100 years ago to deal with that challenge. But there was a flaw. And the flaw was that my great-grandfather and his friends and peers, when arriving in the port of Jaffa, would not see that Jaffa is predominantly an Arab city. And they would not see the Arab towns on the way to Jerusalem and the Palestinian villages. They would not see that the land is populated by half a million Arabs. I do not accept the fact or the claim that they were invading conquistadors. They were not. They came back to the ancient homeland of our people. There was no political entity, Palestinian entity at the time. There was no Palestinian republic, no Palestinian kingdom. The Middle East was in a kind of chaotic situation under the Ottoman Empire. But the Arabs were there. And because 
the deep, desperate need Herbert Bentwich and Herzl and the others had to have that land, to build that home in that land, they would not see the other. They would not see the consequences of penetrating a land populated by another people. So in many ways, what you have already in the beginning are the seeds of everything we see today. The seeds of the triumph, which is Israel's incredible existence. And every day when you watch Israel, its success, the way it lives, its livelihood, you realize what a deep need there was to have Israel. Because if Israel is there against all odds, facing so many challenges in the way it is there, that's a proof of what the deep need to have it. But on the other hand, you have this ongoing conflict, this 100-year war. That's the deep tragedy based on the fact that we did not see our Arab neighbors, and they would not see us. We, later on, would not recognize the fact that they had become a people, and they would not recognize the fact that we are a people. In the book, I travel in space and time and go through the entire saga. But I end by going in the footsteps of my great-grandfather, looking at what was achieved in that country and what was not achieved. What was success and what was failure. And what I see is, on the one hand, the most endangered nation on the face of the earth. Again, something sometimes overlooked by many people in the international community. People in so many ways are troubled, like myself, by occupation, that they overlook intimidation. And intimidation is an essential part of our Israeli condition. And intimidation is based on the fact that there are three fundamental tensions between Israel and its neighbors. There is the tension between 6.2 million Jews and many of the one and a half billion Muslims surrounding them, not all, but many. There is the tension between 8 million Israelis and the 370 million Arabs surrounding them. Right now, many of these Arabs are our friends. They look actually to us as their allies, as their reliable allies. But that does not change the fact that there is an inherent tension between the Arab world and the non-Arab national state, nation state Israelis. And then there is the deep tension, the bitter tension, between us and our Palestinian neighbors fighting for the, for the same land. So although I am always hopeful about peace, I believe in peace, and I want peace, I acknowledge the fact that the conflict between us and the Palestinians is not only about occupation and settlements, but it's a deep, deep conflict that has religious and historical and social dimensions that is so difficult to solve. And it creates an ongoing burden on our existence and makes us an endangered nation. But I, what I see, on the other hand, in that chapter, is that while we do live on the edge, while Israel is a nation of people living dangerously, we have turned our life on the edge to a source of power. We've not become passive or pessimistic or sad or depressed. On the contrary, on the contrary, what you see in Israel is an amazing phenomena of people who are dealing with their challenged condition in a kind of heroic civilian way. So while Zionism failed to create in Israel the utopia it set out to build, while the kibbutz dream is shattered, and there will not be a socialist paradise there, and we will not have the perfect social justice society, what Zionism managed to build, to create, is one of the world's most amazing, robust, free societies. We are innovative and creative 
and sensual and sexy. We make more babies than any other OECD country. <laughs> and that's a very telling indicator. Very telling indicator. Because while this people is a people that have come from death and are endangered by death, we have chosen life. And we celebrate life in the most phenomenal way possible. So why Israel? Because there is a home need to have a home for a hopeless people. And what's Israel? It's the most striking phenomenon of vitality against all odds. Will Israel? That depends on us. It depends both on the Israelis living there, but it also depends on our allies, Jews and non-Jews in this country and elsewhere. In my mind, the greatest achievement of the Jewish people in the last 67 years with the creation of Jewish sovereignty in the Holy Land and the creation of a perfect diaspora in this land. These are two man-made miracles. Both here and there, people are so preoccupied with internal rivalries and bitterness and criticism that we lose sight of this astonishing achievement. After we nearly vanished, in the first half of the 20th century, we had these two tremendous triumphs in the second half of the 20th century. But both are challenged. We are challenged in our way with Iran, with occupation, with legitimacy, with our internal problems. The American Jewish community is challenged here in other ways, which everyone here knows all too well. But if we are to survive, and if we are to flourish, and we have to, we are to guarantee the future of the Jewish people, we must go back to some of the imagination and brilliancy and determination of the founders of Zionism and the founders of this community here. We must learn, on the one hand, to love each other again to see how great these achievements are. But on the other hand, we must see to what degree they are challenged. Only if we combine that renewed love with a renewed sense of realism, seeing what the challenges are, and only if these two great communities, the American Jewish community and the Israeli Jewish community, will reach out to each other in a new way that is realistic, that is relevant, that is, can survive and be relevant in the 21st century, only if we do that, we can guarantee our future in the same way that these amazing founders of Zionism did over 100 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, well, I have a few time for a few questions, and I have about 500. But um, how many people here have read the book? Wow, you're fast readers. How many people here have the book? Great. So your your work here is done. You didn't you, <laughs> you didn't ask how many people liked the book. <laughs> I did. That's what counts. Um, there you go. Thank you. I want to start with the book's most controversial chapter. You know which it is. It was the one reprinted in the New York Times, in the New Yorker, Lida, where you talk about the, um, the, the fighting that took place there and the massacre of Lida residents by Jewish forces. And um, you received a lot of criticism for it, about its accuracy, about whether it happened the way you said it happened. And I was going to ask you about that. And then I thought, why? What's the difference? Why does Lida matter for the future of Israel? What's the point of us learning about Lida? How does it matter for the future of Israel? 
Well, first of all, I, th I thought uh, you cannot tell the story of Israel without acknowledging this dark part of it. Uh, so you do not, as, as the book tries to tell the story, I think that ignoring this part of the story would have been fake, would have been wrong, would have made the whole entire project, my project, in my mind, immoral. But in some ways, what you did, you were talking up there about how we have to reclaim the narrative, the post, the pre-1967 narrative. You upset the narrative. No, 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 on the contrary. I think I, I really help it, but I'll, 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 I'll get into that. I, I just want to answer your question. I don't know if you remember what your question was. <laughs> I'll tell you why it matters. <laughs> You're here to remind me. I'll, I'll tell you why it matters. It it's even matters to you know, the op-ed I wrote tonight uh, here in LA for the published uh, probably now in, uh, in arts and dealing with the Jewish state issue. We have to understand that what's on the Palestinians' mind, contrary to what sometimes their official spokesmen and women say, is mainly 48. This 1967 illusion is a very convenient illusion, both for the Israeli left, for people like me, the peace movement, and it's convenient for others who want to, actually it's, it's convenient for the best people, who have the best intentions and the most benign values, because they want to believe that the entire conflict is about occupation. We, we end occupation, conflict ends, we are okay. That's not the case, because Palestinian identity is shaped by the trauma of 48. And this is why, even in practical terms, it's so important to realize that this is their tragedy, this is their pain, this is their concern, and you have to deal with it. And here I, I answer your second question. What I say is it was my moral duty to acknowledge Lida, and it's the Palestinians' duty to overcome Lida. Because, and it, in this sense, it's very important to put Lida in two layers of context. One is that the 1948 war was brutal one. It was a terrible civil war. You had some civil war in this country. And in this civil war, wherever the Arab forces won, not one Jew remained. And many atrocities took place. So it wasn't the case that the Palestinians are just righteous victims. There was, it was all it happened with, if the, the reason there is a leader chapter and not an Estziona chapter or a Rishon Lezion chapter or a Chova chapter is because we happened to win. Had they won, they would have probably, we would not have been there and probably many of us, if not most of us, would have been slaughtered. So that's one context. The other layer of context is the fact that the 1940s were not 2014, it was a brutal era. Not, I'm not talking about the Nazis, leave aside the Nazis. Throughout Europe, in, mid, in the 1940s, there were millions of refugees. In India, Pakistan, there were millions of refugees. And if to make historical comparisons, you know, the British bombarded Dresden, which is like 100 times worse than Lida, and no one claims that the United Kingdom is not legitimate because of Dresden. So this is very important to the second layer of conflict. The third one is the most sensitive one to be talked about in this country. So and because I'm such a lover and admirer of America, and I'm, I will not talk about your history, but sometimes when I hear Canadian liberals and Australian liberals condemning Israel for the way it treats its other, I wonder where is the Australian other and where is the Canadian other? What is this liberalism in Canada and Australia based, if not on the, the fact that the other is gone? So I really think that what I did is, on the one hand, put this, so to speak, on the map, realize that it was there. But on the other hand, put it within the context of our history, our tragedy. No one, no one can compete with the Jews in the victimhood game. So I urge the Palestinians not to get into that game because they lose. And I think that there is a lesson to be learned from the productive, constructive spirit of Israel of how we dealt with our tragedy, with our terrible past, not becoming suicide bombers because of the Holocaust, 
but actually choosing life, educating our children, building a health system, building a nation. You write in the book on the same tone of Lida that Hulda, the, 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 the town that Amos Oz lives in, and um, which, whose Arab village was also destroyed by Jewish forces. You write, Hulda says, peace shall not be. And you come back to that theme that, the, in some ways, the original sin of Zionism precludes peace. And yet, we know there has been a kind of a treaty with Jordan, a kind of a treaty with Egypt, a kind of an a, a armistice ceasefire with Syria, a Saudi Arabian peace. In other words, there are maybe love, but there's certainly, do you really think it precludes peace? Let me give you uh, two, three answers. One, I don't say it's sin. I see this as the peak, the height of the tragedy. I don't think that what, what happened in 1948 was, you know, we suddenly decided to act in a brutal way. This was the outcome of the inbuilt tragedy of these two people not acknowledging each other, not recognizing each other, being blind to each other. So that, everything that happened in 48 was the result of, of that. It, I see it as a tragedy. I'm not writing in a kind, I'm not a moral preacher. I, in a sense, I, I, this part of it is telling the tragedy. So that's number one. Number two, it's true that I have some pessimistic lines there about the ability to achieve peace. But first of all, I'm always for trying, and I think at every given moment we should reach out and try, and I think the challenge is to prove me wrong on that. And I'd be the happiest person to be proven wrong. Unlike many people on the right, I'd be the first one to endorse peace and, 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 and celebrate it. And this was one of the reasons I support very much Secretary Kerry's initiative, although I have some doubts whether it'll succeed because of my claim, but I support it. So I think it's, there's a duty to try it and to see perhaps you're right, perhaps things have changed. But there's no comparison between the conflict between us and the Palestinians and the conflict with the Egyptians and the Jordanians because of this history. And this has to be understood. This is not a dispute about borders, about territories. It's basically a dispute about two people not seeing each other. And in my mind, actually, Israel is the one that went the longer way in the last 20 years. Because what we did in 1993 is to acknowledge the fact that there is a Palestinian people that has legitimate rights. And what we did in 2000 in Camp David was to acknowledge the fact that there is a right and a need to establish a Palestinian state that will express these rights. To my great regret, and I think because of this history that I'm talking about and because of some other problems that have to do with Palestinian political culture, the Palestinians, ironically, are the ones who did not do the same. To this day, the Palestinian leadership did not recognize the fact there is a Jewish people that has legitimate rights in the Holy Land that deserves to have a Jewish democratic state as its national home. And, and, you, and, and, and if you allow me, yeah. because I think this is essential now, because on this thing, I think there is, the people do not get it, that I, Israel actually, Israel is the one as I describe so much our blindness, our early blindness, and then the 48 blindness and so on, Israel opened its eyes in the late 80s and the 1990s, and sometimes people forget, and again, I'm very critical of the government, of occupation, of settlements, but let's put it in context. In the last 20 years, Israelis opened their hearts four times for peace. In 1993, we signed the agreement with Yasser Arafat, in May 1994, Yasser Arafat arrives in Gaza. Now, to correct me if I'm wrong, but America never really find a, never found a way to make peace with Fidel Castro. <laughs> Yasser Arafat, for us, is 100 times more dangerous, more demonic than Fidel Castro is to you. Yet Fidel Castro never landed in the West Palm Beach airport. And Yasser Arafat did come to Gaza. What, what was the outcome? Five months later, a first bus explodes in central Tel Aviv. 
Two years later, less than two years, we get out of the West Bank cities of Ramallah, Jenin, Nablus. What happens? Two months later, a wave of terrorism in Tel Aviv in Jerusalem, in which the son of one of my close friends dies. Four years later, Israelis yet again try peace again. Elba goes to Bill Clinton's Camp David and breaks every Israeli taboo, every Israeli taboo, a Palestinian state, that's something that was taboo in Israeli politics, dividing Jerusalem, a taboo in Israeli politics, and offering 100% of the Gaza Strip and 94, 95, 92% of the West Bank. What's the result? A horrific wave of terror, of suicide bombing, the worst terror offensive one can imagine. Five years, just, just let me finish because this is no, really important. No, no, no. Five years later, Alex Shawan, the frightening Alex Shawan, pulls out of Gaza, destroys the settlements. There isn't one settlement left in Gaza, not one checkpoint. What's the result? Not a Palestinian Singapore, but a Hamas controlled rocket base that attacked southern Israel. So, Israelis experience, middle of the road Israelis, as I said the other evening here in the town, the real Israeli wish, the real Israeli dream is to be California. <laughs> That's what we really want. Most Israelis are not into national grandeur. They are not into messianic religion. That's not the case. They want a home. They want a lawn. They want to raise their children. They want to move on with their life. The problem is that our California is surrounded by Hayatollahs. Our California finds itself in conflict. And as I, I write in the book, for a while, I mean, when you think about our orange groves and your orange groves here, for a while we were California. And in some respects, we are California. You have Silicon Valley and we have startup nations. You have your beaches and we have our beaches. But the conflict, while there is this happiness and openness, the California kind of openness in Israel, you have this this, this state, this nation, all the time threatened by dark forces and brutal forces. So again, I think we did a lot of things wrong. I am against occupation. I think we have to try to end it. But all of this has to put into context. Basically, the majority of Israelis really want peace, and they really are willing to reach out to a new future. But all their previous attempts to do that ended with traumas, and we must ensure that the next one does not end in a trauma as again. So if the black box of Zionism is Lida, which you call it the black box of Zionism, the thing we don't talk about is the black box of the Palestinians is that the rejection of a Jewish state in that part of the world. From That's the, the one dimension. I, th yeah. I, think, I think there is an inherent difficulty, as I said briefly now, I think there is an inherent difficulty in accepting, again, recognizing the fact that the Jews belong, that we did not come from Mars, so that we are a people, and that we are a people that belong to the land, and therefore we have a right to establish a, not only Israel as a fait accompli, as a powerful uh, as, as political structure, but there is the need to accept that we are really, we belong there, and we have to share between them and us. So do you agree with Prime Minister Netanyahu that the Palestinians should agree that it should sign a peace treaty that says Israel is a Jewish state? Absolutely. I mean, on this, on this one, why I disagree with him on many issues, I don't tell anyone, but I think I was actually there before he was there. I mean, I, um, it's, it's true. I'm, I'm a bit obsessive about this, but I, I'm willing to defend my obsession. Look, I was a naive, old-fashioned kind of peacenik. The moment the news came about the Oslo Agreement, I was so happy, so happy. I celebrated with my friends for two days. Then something went wrong. I got the text of the agreement, of the Oslo Accord, and I read the Oslo Accord and I said, there's a word missing here. The word Jewish is missing. How can you think that you're ending the conflict between the Jewish people and the Palestinian people? That that is what the conflict is about. We did not recognize them as a people. 
They did not recognize us as a people. How can you think that you end it without the fact that they recognizing us as, as a Jewish people? And ever since, I've been writing about it time after time. I can tell you that my, my friends on the peace movement, when they went out to create the Geneva Initiative in about over 10 years ago, they actually had, we had conversations about it, and they saw my point, and they actually tried to get it. They were shocked how difficult it was to get Palestinian recognition of, of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. They did their best. And I think that this is essential. Why? Because at the end of the day, you want the Palestinian boy and the Palestinian girl in the Dehesha refugee camp to know that the Jews are legitimate in the land, that we are not colonialists, that we've not come from Mars, that we have our disagreements, we don't know where the border will be, all that. But they have to understand that we are legitimate. If they do not accept, if, if I'm not willing to shake your hand, if I'm not willing to call you by your family name, what kind of peace is it? So if, again, I think that if peace is not there right now, we have to act. I don't think that we, the status quo is very dangerous and we have to act in a determined way, dramatic way, to end occupation. But we must look at the peace question with honesty and dignity. So and if, in my mind, if we recognize a Palestinian people and a Palestinian state, what's the problem, what's the issue about demanding that Israel would be recognized as a Jewish state? So you wouldn't sign the treaty if it weren't there? Look, I was asked that question and, you know, I mean, I mean, there is an element in me that is, you know, is still, a, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, bleeding heart peacenik. So it'll be, <laughs> it'll be very difficult for me to to refuse it. But I think, I think that the demand is absolutely just, and we have to do everything possible to get it. I will find difficult, you know, to to if there is the perfect agreement, you know, I I, I will be. Personally, I probably be, find it difficult to say no, but, but the demand is absolutely just, and we really have to try to, by the way, I think that it'll be easier to Palestinians to do that than to give some other concessions, and it's also very important in our relationship with Europe, because when I hear Europeans preaching us, I cannot forget the history, and I always make a point of reminding them What's our history with them? First of all, what happened to us? We are their ultimate other, even before the Holocaust, and with everything that happened in the, 19th, the 20th century, and the way they betrayed us time after time since the World War II. So having Europe recognize, really recognize, because the, the UN actually accepted it in 47. It wasn't right. a big issue. Having the Europeans as well recognize the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state, I think is very essential, and I think it is morally justified. And I, I, I think it goes to a point that I know is, is close to you and of great concern to you, which is how American students perceive Israel. And one thing I hear from American students over and over, and if you read the internet, it's, it's certainly all there on the internet, is they don't understand the very concept of a Jewish democratic state. That a state can't be democratic and Jewish for all of its citizens. And you have a fabulous chapter with a friend of yours, uh, Mohammed Dalla, who I think is the head of Adala? The yeah, he he found, was co-founder of Adala. Um, where he says, do you really think you can protect yourself with this contradiction of a Jewish democracy? Um, what you're talking about really seems to address that issue too, or does it just make the issue even more in people's face. So again, there are, there are different dimensions here. First of all, we must, and, and, and here is where I have more criticism of, of, of my government, our, the politics of Israel. We must make clear in our behavior every day that we really mean it about the democratic Jewish state. That means there should not be occupation. And if it cannot end overnight with peace, we should have to go through a long but deep and decisive process of ending it gradually because occupation is endangering us morally, politically, and demographically. So if we want a Jewish democratic state, we really have to prove that we are doing it and, and try to deal with occupation in a serious way. Two, we have to prove that the Jewish element of it does not justify 
ultra-orthodox and all kinds of extremist patterns of behavior in our politics, which jeopardize the rights of women or the rights of minorities and, 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 unacceptable, and the rights of the reform movement and the conservative movement and of non-orthodox Judaism in this country. Mm -hmm. So I think that Israel, if Israel were to prove that it's really a democracy, and, and I think that it, it is, but we have to prove it in, 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 in many fields, then I think that these young American Jewish students you talk about will not be so frightened by the conceptual issue of the Jewish state. What really troubles them is that what they get in the news about Israel is unbecoming. I think that what they experience is a kind of split-screen Israel. On the one hand, they do get the good news about high-tech, about the Tel Aviv cool thing, birthright, all that. On the other hand, Israel is perceived as anachronistic and tribal and strange, and sometimes they see it as their embarrassing relative and they don't know how to treat it. So I think it's our commitment as Israelis, one, to change our ways, really in all the ways I described, but also to reach out to American Jews, especially to progressive American Jews, and especially to young progressive American Jews, in every way possible to renew the alliance between us with a real sense of affinity, because at the end of the day, if we will not prove and manifest in every way possible that we do have shared values, then there will not be an ability to hold this alliance together, which is so essential. And can you explain to them that a state can be democratic and Jewish, that it could be a state for all of its citizens, that they could no. they, they could sing the hat that an Arab could sing the Hatikva and it salute an Israeli flag with the Star of David? Look, uh, as you realize, I have some British family. Not much left, because most of this is what happened to much of European Jewry. My family members in Britain are committed to the Union Jack that has trillion crosses on it. They are committed to the Queen, who is both the head of state and the head of church. So people in this country have to understand that your model, which has no ethnicity in it whatsoever, is actually unusual in the world. There are few countries that have that. Most of the countries, the nations in Europe, are nation states. They are based on a people, and they have some heritage of a certain nationality, but the test is not that. The test is that if the minorities if people who do not belong to the majority have full rights, full liberties, and can, can be elected and elected and all else. This is the test of a democracy. This, so to speak, totally uh, colorblind or ethnicity blind model that you have in America is not what the world is about. Most of the world is not like that. So Israel might look strange to some people, but it's not that much different than so many other countries in the world. When you talk about the tribes, um, one of the, uh, you say that the reason, you, I'm skipping from 1948, but we've made it all the way up to 1967, and you talk about Israel won the 67 war because of cohesion. And then a lot of your book is about the dissipation of the Israeli cohesion. Um, is that inexorable? Is that just, as you were talking up there and as I've heard you speak before, I'm thinking, but maybe this is what every country, you get that excitement and that cohesion or the founding moment, the Big Bang, and then entropy. Great question. Uh, I, I, it's, it's I, have, I have a complex answer to that one. On the one hand, we could not, and we should not have, remained the way we were. Israel, in its first decades, in the decades before it was established, this was really a revolutionary society. People were mobilized to the cause, to the idea, to the belief in an in a, in a incredible and almost inhumane way. They paid enormous personal prices. 
individual rights and identities and freedoms were oppressed. Minority rights and, 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 and liberties and, and, and were oppressed. So in a sense, there was need for that strong, aggressive melting pot to create this nation and to face the, the incredible challenges it faced. But we should, we should have opened up. I mean, we shouldn't have stayed, you know, in all of us in khaki uh, <laughs> uniforms and, uh, and, 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 you know, working the land all the time. This was not unsustainable and it should have changed. So I welcome a lot of the changes that Israel went through. The fact that we are now so open, we respect, it's a really free society. I mean, our, the institutional part of our democracy is flawed. Our institutions don't work properly, contrary to Washington. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, Those don't work, period. <laughs> but, but, but the spirit, I mean, anyone who comes to Israel, Israel is such a free-spirited society. We are, really, we, we are so free. We are like anarchistic, we are wild. So, and, and I think this is, a, this is wonderful. And the fact that so many of the minorities, the Mizrahim, the ultra-Orthodox, the, the Arabs, the Russians, that were, were freed in many ways, they were emancipated and they got their place under the sun, so to speak. So that's the good news. The, the fact that individuals should have space, minorities should have space, and, and, and it's also what, what emerges as a result of that is a very colorful, rich society that is really very pluralistic. It's, you know, it's a bit like a circus, like a wild circus. The problem is that in order to hold all this together, you need a new political deal that will take these different tribes and, and create a kind of uh, a covenant between them. How do we handle our affairs? Where are we one? Where are we give our we walk in different ways? You, you need you need something that is unifying while respecting the plurality, and I do not see that yet. I I'm very optimistic. I'm sure that we will find that, and I think that once we'll find that balance, amazing things will come out of Israel. But at the moment. There is this celebration of diversity, but there is political uh, impotence in many ways because the, the state that was too aggressive, is too dominant in the past, in many ways is too weak and, and, and the politics is dysfunctional in many ways. Uh, and, and this is the tension we find ourselves in. So my hope and my belief is that if we channel the great energy of the Israeli society and the Israeli individuals, it was so remarkable, if we channel some of that energy back into our politics, into the way we run our public affairs, the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. Thank you. We're going Thank to take some questions from the audience. Uh, this is really a, a wonderful conversation, and we would now like to open up, we have about 25 minutes uh, to hear questions from you. Um, as Ari said, uh, Israelis are wild and anarchistic, but our questions are not going to be. Um, <laughs> right, uh, you, you need to, I, everybody has strong opinions about Israel, uh, about the issues that we're discussing, um, but you need to ask questions. Uh, we're all here to hear Ari Shavit speak. Um, um, so please uh, ask your questions succinctly. Um, the usher will be holding the microphone for you in the aisle, and we would like to uh, first uh, take questions, any questions from students uh, who are here. And I'm going to uh, play the role of the bad cop. If you go on for too long, I'm going to ask the usher to move the microphone to the next questioner. So if you have a question, please uh, step into the aisle to uh, ask the question. Uh, Mr. Shavid, thank you so much for coming and speaking here at UCLA. Uh, my name is Saeed, and I'm a history student here. Um, kind of at the beginning of the discussion, you mentioned the need for Israeli society, Palestinians perhaps as well, but the need for Israeli society to come to terms with 1948 in a certain way in order to resolve the conflict. And I'm curious, in what way uh, do you think that might be possible? In what way can we resolve the conflict? Sure. In, in what ways do you see that uh, coming about? Well, as, as people say, the, 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 the formula seems to be known. I mean, we all assume that something 
a long line, the Clinton parameters that were then transferred, to, translated to the Olmert plan, the Barack plan, and now what Secretary Kerry is struggling with. These are the outlines of the two-state solution. My claim is that, that while we have to try to reach that two-state solution, we have to prepare plan B. Because you know, I've been given Secretary Kerry all the support I can in my writing in Israel. I admire his initiative, his commitment, his, his energy, his courage. I really support his, his goal, his values. I'm sure he, he cares very much about Israelis and about Palestinians. He's genuine, he's been, in many ways, he surprised us all, but achieving more than expected. But given the history, given the reality of the region, the brutal history and the brutal geostrategic surrounding, I think that it will be irresponsible not to plan plan B. And in my mind, I always say that I do hope that in some secret basement in the State Department, there is a great team working on Plan B. Because if, God forbid, Secretary Kerry will fail, and, and either now or later on, say he gets this document now, but the, the, the ramifications will be disastrous. Because Palestinians will feel betrayed, Israelis will feel betrayed, and the next Secretary of State will not want to touch this. So we really might end up in a situation where a great benign endeavor designed to save the two-state solution ends with the two-state solution shattered. So because we know that we tried this so many times in the past and it failed, because we know the region is such a chaotic state, which makes things even more difficult. I think a responsible approach leads to the conclusion you have to prepare plan B. And my general idea regarding this is that we, we have to try to create, if, again, I'm all for the big deal, for the final status, but if it is not reached, let us plan a process where we try to create a two-state state before there is a two-state solution, where the Palestinians have Israel, the Palestinians go into a process of nation building, while Israel goes to a process of nation saving by ending occupation. Now, you cannot end occupation when there is no peace in the way that you do with peace. You cannot retreat to the 67 line. You cannot do it within a year. We're talking about the long process, gradual, cautious, and creative. But I think that actually there are many positive factors on the ground. Because the one good, of piece, good piece of news that came out of the region, and America's probably only real great success in the Middle East in the last years, was the Fayyad process in the West Bank. Fayyad, in my mind, is the hero of the Palestinian people. I think that he changed. He brought into Palestinian public life something that was never there before, which is a sincere care about their own people, trying to real, get real life better, really caring about the young, the hospitals, the schools, and so on. I think, although Fayyad is now gone, I hope he'll be back, now he's gone, I think Fayyadism is there. So if Israel will go into a process where it first freezes the settlements beyond the blocks, not all the settlements, but then it gradually goes into take steps that evacuate parts of the West Bank, and in each one of the areas evacuated, a kind of rawabi is built, a kind of new Palestinian town that gives new life to Palestinian youngsters, then you have a process that is very different from the simplistic unilateralism that we tried in Gaza, but you have a kind of sophisticated, coordinated, creative unilateralism, which enables us to move forward, although we're not solving the issue. Because I think that Palestinians at this moment, I do not see them, again, I hope I'm wrong, dealing with the trauma and the, and the ideologic problems of 48 and Jerusalem. But they do want to move forward. So if we, and, on the, and the Israelis, 
it will be very difficult to deal with the entire settlement issue in, in one stroke. So if you create such a creative uh, uh, process, I think it can lead us to a situation where you have the emergence of a two-state state, and then when we are more relaxed and more mature, I hope that we'll be able to deal with the core issues and actually sign the grand peace agreement. So this is, you know, this is my approach. This is what, what, what I would go for. I think that another factor that is very important here is the fact that the new reality in the Middle East is that the moderate Sunni Arab nations actually want to work with Israel because they're so afraid of Iran and they're afraid of the Islamic Brotherhood. And they have some reservations about Washington. So. Because of that, they actually want us as their friends. But there is no moderate Arab, in my mind, and again, I hope to be proven wrong, who has enough legitimacy now to make compromises on Jerusalem. And they are needed if you are, you are going to strike a deal. While, so that I do not see the Saudi king being a part of a, a, a Jerusalem a deal. I do see him channeling some of his billions to the West Bank to finance major development in the West Bank because he and other Arab leaders want good news out of the region. So actually you can combine the specific issue of occupation with the larger challenge of the Middle East. And if America will lead this process, which I hope it would, it will give some substance to a new alliance between America and its all allies who feel somewhat lonely in, in recent years. So in my mind, this kind of approach will be right in every way possible. It's good for Israel because it's something we can do. It's good for the Palestinians because it does not, it's something they can deal with. It's good for the Arab neighbors because this is something they can cooperate in. And I think it's great for America because it will enable it to lead a process that leads somewhere. But again, let me stress, if the secretary gets his document and gets a final peace agreement, I'll endorse it. I'll be very happy. But let's prepare for the possibility that this does not happen. OK, do we have another question from a student? And then... uh, hello. Uh, my name is Maya Ferdman. Again, thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm a senior in global studies here at UCLA. Um, so you mentioned um, American Jewish progressive students and how they view Israel in sort of a split screen. On the one hand, they're very um, dedicated to Israel, and on the other, they see all of this unfortunate news about occupation. So I wanted to know if BDS, Boycotts, Divestments, and Sanctions, is the only avenue right now that's sort of present on campus to fight occupation, but if a, a progressive American Jews do not support that, what is an effective way to both support Israel, but at the same time, fight occupation from here on this side of the world? No, I, I, I didn't quite get the question part. So, so, so regarding so, BDS, what, what was the question, actually? So if an American progressive Jew does not support BDS as a way to fight occupation, what is a, pro a productive way for an American Jewish student to support Israel, but also to fight occupation from over okay. here in the US? Okay. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's almost obvious. I think, look, what my claim is, because I believe that the, the, the need, I think that the problem we had was that for too long, we had an alliance between Tea Party America and Tea Party Israel. And we have to build, to rebuild, the alliance, a real alliance, because non-Tea Party America and non-Tea Party Israel. And the way to do it so for, is, first of all, not to withdraw into some sort of isolationism. I don't want you to withdraw into your community, the, your boundaries of your community, and I don't want my fellow Israelis to withdraw into our boundaries. That means that I want you to be engaged with whatever part of Israel you identify with in any way. And I want Israelis to be engaged here as well, but I'll get to that in a minute. So the answer to your question is get, find that part of Israel that you like, even the political. So if you, if you are 
you know, conservative and you want to support conservative causes in Israel, go ahead. If you are progressive and you want peace and you want to, to, to see a more progressive Israel like me, go and be engaged with those Israeli organizations and Israeli-related organizations to do that. I think there is nothing, it, it seems a bit complex, but there is nothing more beautiful than defending Israel's basic rights and, and basic justice in campus in the most passionate and adamant way while trying to reform Israel and change it for the better. I think this is, it's, 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 it's right and, and it's, it, it can energize actually people. And, and really one of, you know, one of the nice reactions to, to the book that I got was so many people who came to me and said to me, you enabled, us, or enabled me to love Israel again, but in a critical and realistic way. And I think this is the way to go about it because Israel should not be some saint. And it needs not to be insane. There are no nations in the world that, that are saintly. And, 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 and so you can criticize it. You can find to change it while you really fight BDS and the other movements. I mean, these kind of vicious attacks on Israel's legitimacy are not only wrong for Jews. In my mind, they are wrong in universal terms. This is immoral. And it's time to turn the tables on this. We should not be so defensive. We should go out and call these people and say, describe what they do as what it is. This attempt, I said it to some of the students I met earlier. There is nothing more different than Martin Luther King, than BDS. BDS is so, I mean, if Martin Luther King would have come here and would have heard this kind of language used, this is so wrong, this is so aggressive, this is so inhumane. You have issue with Israel, deal with it, protest, talk. But this attempt to, 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 to totally, to, to not to deal with it, not to, willing to, to have dialogue with it, to try to, to, to use aggressive tools against this. This is end with totally singling out Israel. I mean, how, if you care about human rights violations? I respect that. So let take, let's take the globe. Let's look at all the countries around the globe. And let's begin to go one by one. Where are the most serious human rights violations? I suggest beginning with, I don't know, China, Russia. There are several other candidates. I'm not speaking about what's happening in Syria and who's supporting Syria. So anyone who singles out Israel looks only specifically, and I might agree with a certain point, you know, I, I have criticism of Israel, but the context of this movement and this attempt is outrageous. There is no integrity there whatsoever. So just to, to answer, to finish the answer, I think it's absolutely, we're all committed to tikkun olam. We can also be committed to tikkun Israel. So I think that if we combine the spirit of avat Israel with tikkun Israel, we can get it right. Okay, it, uh, it, another question from a student and then we'll open it up to uh, Over here, ushers. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm a third year poli sci student here. And uh, I was curious to see what you thought of the Syrian crisis, actually, that you mentioned it, and uh, maybe the instability that's causing in Lebanon and how that could affect possible future prospects for peace and attempts currently going on right now. You mean the Syrian crisis a few months ago? Right, yeah, and just kind of the instability that's caused for the region and, and how that's affecting Israel right now and the prospects for peace. So first of all, let me connect the, the previous question with, with this one. There is this emerging trend 
of endorsing the one-state solution. In my mind, the one-state solution is like a, a beautiful red poisoned apple. <laughs> it looks nice, it sounds nice, it's all about equality and democracy, but it's lethal. And if you need any proof, look at Syria. Syria is a one-state solution. They tried to put the Sunnis and the Alawis in one state. As long as there was a strong dictator torturing enough people, killing enough people, doing what he can, it was not uh, Denmark, but it would function in some sort of way. The moment the dictator got weak, it became the worst arena of bloodshed in the world. Now, if this is what's happening in Syria, between Arabs, imagine what will happen if we try the one-state solution between Jews and Palestinians in Israel. So Syria has to be on our minds, not only in the specific chain of events, what happened with the on that crisis to which I'll refer to in a, in a second. Syria is, shows you what's wrong with much of the Middle East. That once you lose dictatorship power, you have the emergence of violent chaos that is deadly in, in uncomprehensible ways. So we have to look at it and address it Serious. There is another point about Syria. For many, many years, the claim of many anti-Israeli intellectuals and anti-Zionist intellectuals was that Israel was an artificial entity created by the empires. Look around Israel now. What you see is that many of the Arab nation states were artificial entities created by the empires. While well, Israel, as I said before, with its vibrancy, proves that it's, it's, it was not artificial at all, at all. There was a real people that had a real need to have this real state. And this is why it's so real, sometimes too real. <laughs> so when you look around the region and you see there are no Iraqis anymore. There are only Sunnis and Shiites at times, for a moment, with American umbrella, finding a way to live with one another, and then it disintegrates. There are no Syrians anymore. There are no Lebanese. There are no Libyans. There are Egyptians. Egypt has a strong entity. It's a natural state. But many of the other nation states that were supposed to be natural, well, we were supposed to be artificial, have disintegrated. And, 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 and the implication, look, this is such a dramatic change. Really, in this sense, a, a 90 year or almost a 100 year order had collapsed. And we do not know where this is leading us yet. So these are the deeper points about Syria. Specifically, in my mind, I did not support necessarily you know, a military strike there for many reasons. The, the chemical weapons were a huge problem and the danger of the Al-Qaeda forces there overtaking new, uh, uh, chemical weapons was a deep one. On the other hand, Assad's behavior of, was of course un, unacceptable. In a sense, what happened as a result of the, the crisis was not, it, it's not a good result, but it's not the worst result possible. So let's see. The problem is that the credit was given to Vladimir Putin. I do not want Vladimir Putin to be the king of the Middle East or the king of any other region. I really prefer, and I'm not saying it to you only because you are Americans, I think there is no one to match America's leadership in the world. America, with all its faults and mistakes, gave the world much more peace and much more stability than any other superpower would have given. And the last thing I want to see, not only as an Israeli as in a, who lives in the Middle East, but as a citizen of this world, I do not want to see American decline. 
A world that will not have strong, moral American leadership will be a world we do not want to live in. So, so that was the bad news about Syria, that, that Putin taking it. But what was the good news? And this is relevant, especially not to Syria, but to Iran. What you saw, that when there is willingness to act on the behalf of the West, when there is a real big stick on the one hand, and there is political diplomatic ingenuity on the other hand, you get a reasonable result. So in my mind, when people came back, so to speak, from that crisis in Syria, the lesson for Iran was so clear. I thought of it before, but after Syria it was so clear. You need a combination of a very assertive approach with political ingenuity. And then you can move forward because thugs don't understand other ways. And the Iranian regime, there is no way that they will give up their project without a sense that there is a strong, determined West willing to deal with it. So this is what's so important about Syria. I think that only if we have this kind of com combined, sophisticated approach of real threat on the one hand with generosity and ingenuity and, 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 and political will, then that's the only way to resolve the Iranian crisis or the Iranian challenge without getting into scenarios that can become catastrophic. All right, we've got time for a couple of questions, not just from UCLA students, but from lifelong students. So uh, anyone who... Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Rose. Um, Thank you for a very important book. Thank you. Back to Lida. You make it clear in the book that the Israeli leaders at that time, in 1948, felt that there was a dichotomy. Either the Arabs of Lida and other, other towns were to be expelled, or there would not be a Jewish state. Somewhere in there you say, the Zion, either the Zionist dream or the Citizens of Lida have to be out. Uh, why did they make that assumption? I mean, we know today there are lots of Arabs living in Israel, lots of towns. Uh, why could they have not accepted an Arab Lida? Why did they make that assumption that the Arabs of Lida had to go for there to be a Jewish state? And my second part of my question is, do you, accept, do you believe that their assumption was correct? Again, I didn't understand. Do was... you believe that that assumption they were making, that there was this either or, was correct? Look, uh, first of all, again, to put it in context, one has to, to remember that it was the Arab League and the Palestinian leadership that rejected the partition plan and the, the decision by the UN to create two states, one Arab, one Jewish. These were the terms of that uh, UN resolution. But had that resolution been implied, you would have had a tiny Jewish state uh, that would have had an enormously large Palestinian minority within it. I find it, I, I think I'm, I know for a fact that the leaders of that, of the Zionist movement at that time did not think that that's a viable option. And, and I ask you, ask anyone to answer that. I think that was the tragic situation that was created. It was not, it was, hostility was so deep, violence was so bad, I describe it in that chapter, you know, there were so many attacks you know, in that area and others. There was so much Arab brutality and then Jewish brutality that to imagine uh, uh, a, a tiny Jewish state with a 45% Palestinian minority 
And I, I, I refer you to the fact that at the same time, something very similar, very similar, happened in India and Pakistan. Uh, almost the same time. And uh, as I said, it was a brutal era. And, and, and people were very cruel with one another in, 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 in terrible ways. So I think that, uh, that what I claim in the book is, is right, that this, this was the very core of the tragedy. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Hi, my name is Stephanie Sabar. I, I think you have a wonderful ability to see both sides of things and put things in context so you can understand why people are how they are. And then you point out that people there can't see each other. And uh, I just wondered how in operational terms could this be changed on the individual psychological level, how people could meet each other and see each other as human beings. You, you mean in the context of the conflict? Yeah, and the whole situation in Israel. I mean, how so can I, people... So, I, I, so, so I, I, I thank you for this question. I think I, I hinted at this, but, but I do believe, again, I think that you can hear that I'm no flower child. I'm not a child anymore, and I'm not a flower. <laughs> and so I see things, in, I think, in a pretty realistic way. I look, you know, I'm not naive, but... I think, and this is why I welcome your question so much, I think that to add to what I said before about like my plan B and, and you know, the, dealing with, with the harsh reality, I do believe in the human spirit and I do believe in human dialogue. And I think that had we had an Israeli prime minister going to Ramallah, and saying to the Palestinians, we acknowledge that you had this traumatic past. That we acknowledge the, the fact we went through all this terrible suffering and terrible pain. And yet, I urge you not to be addicted to that, not to be victims of your past, but to be the creators of your future. And if he will ask them, Trust, to try to start anew, to open a new page. And while the gradual retreat is happening and the gradual nation building is happening and the gradual rawabis are being built and the Saudi money coming and the American support happening, if we will not only have a political process and an economic process and military arrangements and all that, but on top of all this, all this will be under the big tent of human greatness, of human generosity, of, of being gracious. I think that you'll be shocked by the results. It will not end the conflict. It will not create a peace out of the blue. But it will create a totally new state of mind where the two people, who are the victims of this terrible tragedy, these two twins, these two tormented twins of the Holy Land, will be able to see each other at last and begin, if not hugging each other, at least seeing each other and holding each other's hands as we all move to a better future.